So yes, I am Luisa from Technical University of Denmark. I am an assistant professor here and uh, the Technical University of Denmark is situated in Copenhagen. So, and today I will talk about zero knowledge protocols. So first of all, let's see what is a proof. Well, a proof is a protocol between a prover and a verifier where the prover wants to prove to the verifier that some statement holds. Now the prover can be unbound and can have all the time that he wants, while the verifier is assumed to be a polynomial time machine. So uh, a way the, uh, that uh, the prover has to prove the theorem to the verifier is sending him some messages or proof. And after the, uh, the proof is read, by the, is read by the verifier, the verifier can, uh, on input the theorem, decide if uh, to accept or reject this proof. So in particular here, we are saying that the prover is unbounded, but the, but the verifier has only polynomial time capabilities. So we are restricting ourselves to a specific class of, uh, of problem that are called NP problems, which stands for non-deterministic polynomial time uh, problem. And it, uh, um, it's a, a class of problem from complexity theory and this class of problem are, are all the decision problem, which the yes instances can be verified in polynomial time, meaning that there is a certificate or witness such that the polynomial time mach machine can, can take as input X, which is the theorem or instance of the problem, and the certificate or witness for this instance, and can verify that the theorem holds using this certificate, okay? So the concept here can be a bit abstract. So let's first of all see an example of what is an NP problem. And to do that, I am gonna introduce uh, this class of problem that are called graph isomorphism. So in this type of problem, there are, we consider two graphs, the graph G and the graph H. And now we will say that these two graph isom are isomorphic if there exists a permutation that can map each adjacent uh, node in uh, G to an adjacent node in H. So for each pair of nodes that they have an arch, this, uh, there exists a permutation that can map this node to node in H. And, that, and uh, these nodes are still, after we apply the permutation, these nodes are still adjacent in each. And these hold for each pair of nodes. Hmm? So again, let's see here in more details in ex a simple example of what is a graph isomorphism. Here we have two graphs, the graph G and the graph H. And now, we would like to know if they are isomorphic or not. What does it mean? Well, it means that there exists a permutation that maps each node of G in a node of H, and it maintains the, ad the adjacency between each two pair of nodes. So in this case, the, let's take the node one and the node two, and the node two, they are adjacent in G. Now we, we take this, uh, our permutation and we map the node one to the node two in H and we map the node two to the node four in H. So, and then we can check that four and two are actually still adjacent in H as well as the node one and two were adjacent in G. And we can go further and uh, see that the third node in G is mapped to the third node in H and the fifth node in, uh, in G is mapped to the first node in H. And then we can check adjacent again, adjacency again. And this goes for each uh, pairs of node, okay? So that's what is a graph isomorphism. If this hold for the, each pair of nodes, we can, we can say that G and H are actually isomorphic. So 
here it's a very uh, it's a, it's an example very very with very few nodes. So here it's actually uh, easy to find uh, to check if there is a, there exists a permutation between these two graphs. But what about the case where the graphs are very big? Okay, uh, in this case it's not so easy anymore to understand if these two graphs are isomorphic or not. Indeed, uh, find, uh, find, find out if these two graphs are isomorphic takes time that is, uh, we don't know if it's uh, in P or not, but for now the best algorithm takes quasi polynomial time. So more than polynomial time. So, but let's reflect here. Let's go back one second to the example before. Here, giving the permutation, checking if these two graphs are isomorphic would take polynomial time because we just need to apply the permutation and check adjacency, adjacency between the node, which means that there exists actually a certificate or in other words, a witness such that uh, given the instance of the problem, in this case, the graph G and H, I can check that these two graphs are isomorphic. So, and, uh, so the problem is actually a problem in NP. Okay, so let's proceed further and uh, let's have a proof for our, for our theorem. Okay, here the prover wants to prove that this, uh, this graph that now we like and uh, we know they are, are isomorphic, Isomorphic, sorry, the, he wants to prove the prover wants to prove that the verifier that uh, G and H are actually so isomorphic. And how is going to do that? Well, a simple way to do that is just to send the permutation that we saw before to the verifier. Then the verifier can map, it can use this permutation and map each node in G in the node of H and check if they are isomorphic. And since this uh, check can be done in polynomial time, the verifier will accept or reject the proof in polynomial time. So we have now a way to, to prove to a verifier that two graphs are isomorphic. But what about the case in which we want to prove that two graphs are not isomorphic? So that it doesn't exist a permutation that map one to the other. Okay, so can we? The question is, can we do that? And actually, the answer is yes. But in order to do that, we need to introduce more interaction between the prover and the verifier, meaning that the now the prover and the verifier they are not sending just a single message, but they can actually send multiple messages between each other. And now from this interactive proof, we could require two properties. The, the first property says that if the theorem is true, so in the case the graph are not isomorphic, then the prover will believe the, very, uh, sorry, the verifier will believe the prover with the probability one. So if the statement is true, then the verifier will always accept this proof, while there exists a second property that prevents us, that prevents uh, that the verifier will be framed by the prover. What does it mean? Let's say that now the prover wants to misbehave and he is actually malicious. So now the, uh, the, the two graphs are actually isomorphic, but uh, the prover wants to prove to the verifier otherwise. So we are saying that uh, in this interactive proof, the prover will succeed in this malicious intent with the more, at most uh, one half probability, okay? So, and this interactive proof were, were defined for the first time by Goldwasser, Michali, and Ra. What I wanted to give you now is an example of interactive proof for graph not isomorphic. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let's see how. 
But before that, I want to give you a first simple example, a more simple example of what is an interactive proof. Let's say that the prover is color-blinded, is not color-blinded, sorry, is not color, not color-blinded, and he wants to prove to the verifier that he actually is able to see all the colors. So what they can do to, uh, is to run an interactive proof between the prover and the verifier. In this interactive proof, they agree on two colors and on the position of these two colors. Okay, they will agree and the verifier will show them to the prover. So one pencil is blue and one pencil is red. They both know the position of this pencil. Then what the verifier can do is go behind this bat and decide if to swap them or not. In the case, he, he, will, be, he will swap the pencil. He will rotate the pencil or otherwise he will not rotate the pencil. And then he will show this, uh, this pencil to the prover again. And now the prover, if he's not color blinded, is always able to decide if the pencil were swapped or not. While if he is color blinded, he has no idea. So if uh, in this case, there was no swap. So the, pro uh, uh, the prover was correct and the verifier will accept the proof. So let's reasoning now more slowly on the property that we of uh, that we were saying before uh, about interactive proof. So we were saying that if the theorem is true, meaning that in this case the prover is not color blinded, well, the verifier will all uh, will always believe the prover, and uh, we could uh, and here. In this case of interactive proof, we can argue that this happens with the probability one, because in the case uh, the prover is not color blinded, uh, he can always distinguish when the pencil was swapped or not. So the first property holds. And now, what about instead a malicious prover that is actually color blinded? Can he succeed to frame the verifier? What is what is uh, what can be is a uh, possible possible strategy? Well, there actually is a possible strategy of the prover. He, he can just guess if the pencil was swapped or not, and this will happen, uh, and he will be right with the probability one up. So, but uh, now what we can actually do is to repeat this proof many times. So, and each time the, the prover and the verifier will agree on two pencils on their position, then the verifier swap or not swap them. And then each time the, uh, the prover has to say if the pencil has swapped or not. So let's, let's say that we, uh, we repeat this protocol n times for some number n. Then uh, to succeed in proving a false theorem, the prover needs to guess correctly in each of the single execution. So we lower the pro exponentially the probability that the actually the malicious prover can succeed on proving a fourth theorem, can succeed on the fact that uh, on proving that uh, he is not color blind. Hmm? So this was a first a simple example of interactive proof. And now we are ready to come back to prove on proving that the two graphs are not isomorphic. Here again, let me recall you that the prover is unbounded while the, the verifier is a polynomial time machine. Okay? And now the prover wants to prove to the verifier that uh, these two graphs are not isomorphic. Again, G and H are known from both the prover and the verifier. So what actually the, uh, the verifier can do is chosen one of the two graphs at random. Let's say that in this case, he chose the graph G. He will send also, he will pick also a random permutation 
and he will apply this permutation to G. Then he will send this to C. He will send this uh, element computed, this graph that he, com he computed to the prover. And now the prover, since he can, uh, he can run in exponential time, uh, and in this case, in quasi-polynomial time, he can apply the algorithm to check uh, to to find the the permutation between C and G. Okay. So, and uh, this uh, this is actually the protocol. But now let's see why this protocol have the property that we've been saying so far. So, in particular, let's say why uh, if the sediment holds. So the two graphs are not isomorphic. Then the prover always managed to convince the verifier. Well, this is the case because the graphs are not isomorphic. So the prover always know uh, since he can run in exponential time, he can always know on which of the on um, on which of the two graphs the verifier applied the permutation. So he always say, will say the correct answer, will send the back the correct answer to the verifier. Last thing to argue is what about the two graphs are actual isomorphic? Can the, verif uh, can the prover succeed in proving a full theorem in this case? Well, the, the answer is very similar to the one of the case of two pencils. Because here, if the two graphs are isomorphic, well, uh, the prover has no way to understand if the permutation was uh, uh, was computed on G or on H, if he doesn't know the coin of the verifier. Okay? But he, he can guess which of the two graphs the verifier choose. And in this case, he, he can just guess blindly and send one of these uh, two graphs back, or the graph G or the graph H. So it can actually succeed in proving a false theorem with the probability one half. Again here, we could execute this, thing, this multiple times to decrease the probability uh, of the prover to prove a false theorem, okay? So, what I wanted to give you now is a more formal definition of what we've been saying so far about interactive proof. I want to just show you briefly how formally these interactive proofs are defined. Well, they are defined using our object, the prover and the verifier, and they are defined with respect to some, some NP language. So, Meaning, for for instance, an NP language can be the graph isomorphism or the graph not isomorphism. Okay, and then we can have multiple instances of this language. For instance, the graph G and H that we were using in all our example, or the more complicated graph that we saw in the beginning. These are both instances of the same language, and here the instances are defined with X. And then we have our property that we were uh, oh, that we were discussing so far. One is completeness and one is soundness. In the in the property of completeness, we are saying that if the prover and the verifier interact on common input text, where these parentheses uh, indicate interaction between prover and verifier, in the end of this interaction on this common input, the verifier will output one meaning that the verifier will accept condition and on the fact that the theorem is true. While the property of soundness is the one that takes into account, that protects the verifier from a malicious prover that uh, when he is interacting with the verifier wants to prove a false theorem that will make the verifier accept. And we are saying that this event happen with the probability less than s, which in our case was one half. Okay, so this is a, just to give you a more formal uh, 
uh, way, you know, defining this object, object that we were to, we are talking about to, uh, today. So, but let's come back now to our first example, where we wanted to prove that the two graphs are actually isomorphic. And let's uh, have some consideration on this. So here, there is a graph G and a graph H. And to prove that these two graphs are isomorphic, what we do is that the prover send to the verifier the permutation that exists between these two graphs. But this is more, more information that actually the verifier wants, uh, is supposed to know. Because the verifier wants just to be convinced that the statement is true. It doesn't need, to, uh, there is a, no need of leaking additional information, in meaning that the permutation that, uh, the, in this case, that there exists between these two graphs. So the proof that we were taking in consideration so far leaks more information than what the verifier is supposed to know. What we would like to have in the, end, in the interaction between the prover and the verifier is that the verifier knows that the statement is true, but no additional information is actually learned by the verifier. So we would like, in this specific case, to protect the permutation between G and H. So in other words, we would, to, uh, we would like to have that this proof carries no knowledge, zero knowledge, about the the certificate or witness for this theorem, which is the permutation in this specific case. So let's see how we, go, we can do that. Mm -hmm. So we have our theory, favorite theorem. And uh, these two graphs are isomorphic. And now what the prover can do is to sample another graph, uh, which, has, which is isomorphic uh, to both G and H and send this, uh, this to the verifier. The verifier will toss a coin and choose one of the two graphs. So it will choose G or H with the probability one up and send this graph to the, to the prover, which at this point will apply a permutation between uh, G and C and, and will send this permutation back uh, to the verifier which can check if actually uh, this permutation allow, allow him to, uh, to verify that G and C are isomorphic. Okay? And, uh, and here now we, we want to discuss our, uh, this, is still a pro uh, this is still a proof. So for this, uh, uh, for this protocol, we want to still that completeness and soundness holds. So completeness, again, is when the theorem is true. So when the theorem is true and the prover is behaving honestly, we would like that the verifier always accept. And this is exactly the case, because here, if the two graphs are isomorphic, uh, it doesn't matter if the verifier chooses G or H, uh, the prover can always find the permutation to explain the connection between G and C. While, uh, again, if the two uh, the G and H are not isomorphic, well, then he, uh, here the malicious prover can succeed uh, with the probability at most one half because uh, he, can, uh, he can at most sample uh, uh, the graph C homomorphic to G or H, but not to both of them, since G and H are supposed to be not isomorphic. Okay, and now what I give it, uh, now we are introducing our third property here, which is the property of zero knowledge. So how we can, uh, how more formally we could, uh, we could, um, we, could, uh, we could talk about this property of zero knowledge. 
how we came up with this idea that uh, the uh, this pro uh, this protocol this uh, this um, uh, set of messages are not leaking any information about the the witness meaning the permutation in this specific case well we could uh, uh, we could define a new algorithm which is called the simulator the job of the simulator is to produce a transcript meaning a series of messages between him and the verifier such that these messages looks like a and transcript mean a series of messages between the prover and the verifier, between the honest prover and the verifier. So, in other words, I pro the simulator produces a transcript, or the prover and the verifier produce a transcript. And now I give one of these two transcripts to, to a third entity, and this third entity cannot tell me, cannot distinguish if the, uh, this was the output of the simulator or of an honest interaction between prover and verifier. So here, an important point to stress is actually that the simulator S does not have an input to the witness. So in the case of an isomorphic graph, it will not have access to the permutation between G and H. And uh, we'll all, the only thing that the simulator is allowed to know is that the theorem is true. And finally, we are requiring that the simulator runs in uh, expected polynomial time. So almost all the time, it will, it will run in polynomial time. So here and now I will describe a simulator with respect to an honest verifier. What does it mean? Well, it means that the, this verifier wants to try to inf infer more information about the proof about the witness, about the permutation, but uh, he, he will follow the protocol honestly, meaning that he will choose random coin to choose if to send the graph G or H. So the next step that we need to do is to define how S work, how our, how our simulator S work. So our simulator S will toss a coin and we choose a graph. Then it will apply a permutation on G and it will uh, uh, will compute the graph C. At this point, he is able to produce a transcript that is exactly uh, distributed, like uh, the transcript that uh, was generated between the prover and the verifier. It looks like as a transcript generated between the prover and the verifier. And note that in this case, the, uh, the simulator does not know the permutation. So this, uh, this transcript generated by the simulator carry no information about the, uh, uh, the permutation, but this transcript is also distributed as a transcript that is generated between the prover and the verifier. So, it actually carries no knowledge. It doesn't transfer any knowledge about the permutation. Okay. Finally, note that here the coins on with on if to choose G or H are sampled by the simulator, and this is because we are uh, considering only honest verifier. So, like in the case of interactive proof. I wanted to give you some more the, a more formal de definition of zero knowledge. So first of all, a, a zero knowledge protocol is an interactive proof system, uh, which has this uh, additional property of zero knowledge. So it's uh, still, sorry, uh, sound and uh, complete, but moreover has this additional property meaning that there exists an, an expected polynomial time machine that interacting with the verifier that can interact with the verifier. And it produces a transcript that looks like a transcript between the prover and the verifier. Uh, and both are uh, executed on input X. 
But the prover, of course, will have, will have also access to the witness of X. Here, and uh, uh, not, uh, note finally, that this definition is for general zero knowledge. And here, in this definition, we are not restricting on the case of honest verifier. So last thing that I want to touch is uh, one possible application of zero knowledge. That's just to show you why this can be useful. And I choose a very simple example just to, um, just to understand why they can be useful. So let's, let's say that Bob's want to authenticate to a server. He subscribed to a server a long, a long time before, and he want to now access to this service. So what he can do is to send his uh, username and password to the server. And, at, and at this point, the server can check and I'll be authenticated. But, uh, you know, the server can be malicious. Now, in this, in, this, uh, in this specific example, Bob is trusting the server to not sell his password to anybody else. So he's basically trusting the, the server to be honest. What, what we can do using zero knowledge is removing this assumption. And instead, that's, uh, we can just show to the server using zero knowledge, proving in zero knowledge, that uh, Bob's know, uh, uh, know a password for this service. But since right now we are using a proof that is zero knowledge, this password can, will, not anymore, will not be leaked anymore to the service. And uh, with this, I conclude the lecture. I am uh, happy to uh, answer any questions.